அப்பா கடைசியா போட்டாரு அப்பா ஓகே Okay, so we can start. Okay, so shall we start it, sir? Okay. A pleasant morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am Mrs. Kartika, Associate Professor, Nanda College of Pharmacy, Europe. So today uh, we are presenting an, a national webinar on the topic of COVID-19 and diabetes, present by our resource person, Dr. R. Vadivelan. Professor, Department of Pharmacology, JSS College of Pharmacy, UT. On behalf of our institution, I feel grateful to invite our participants from various institutions on this fruitful virtual platform. So I assure that there is no need of introduction for our resource person who have an intellectual personality. So today's webinar is quite interesting with the topic COVID-19 and diabetes. It should be more informative for us in this pandemic condition. And being a pharmacologist, he will feed us more enough to update our knowledge. We feel proud you, sir, by connecting with this virtual platform today. And of course, we would like to express our gratitude to Tiruvi Chanmugan, our chairman, and our secretary, Tiru A. Sandhikumar Pratip, and uh, Thiru S. Thirumurthy, Nanda Educational Trust. Without their motivation and support, organizing this webinar is impossible in this pandemic condition too. So let us welcome our honorable and beloved principal, Dr. T. Shwakumar, Nanda College of Pharmacy. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader, sir. So as per this quote, He is a great inspiration for all of us. I would like to request you, sir, to deliver welcome address and few words to this webinar. Please, sir. Thank you, Kritika. Thank you, for sir. For a wonderful motivational speak before me. A pleasant morning to everyone and warm welcome to our resource person, Dr. R. Vadivelan, Professor, Department of Pharmacology. JSS College of Pharmacy, Neil Grease, to deliver the topic on COVID-19 and diabetes on the national webinar organized by Nanda College of Pharmacy, Europe. 
his uh, charming personality and more interaction with us in the many days recently also interacted at some international conference with us and uh, more supportive to nanda college of pharmacy one of the uh, knowledgeable pharmacologists in and around uh, south india even india and i feel grateful to have you in this online conference and more thankful to you for acknowledge our invitation and for your kind support in this pandemic uh, situation welcome sir yes, for thank this you, thank you sir thank you yeah of course today topic is more interesting relevant to our current situation there is a bi directional relationship between covid 19 and the diabetes on the other hand diabetic is associated with an increased risk of covid 19 because new onset diabetes and severe metabolic complications of pre existing diabetes including diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolarity for which exceptionally high dose of insulin or warranted have been observed in the patient with the covid 19 this manifestation of diabetes pose challenge in clinical management and uh, success to a uh, complex pathophysiology of covid 19 related diabetes i hope you all will understand the theme of this webinar and will enhance it for better future i ensure you all that this conference will be fruitful one for each and everybody in your every aspect i feel happy to have delegates from various institutions such as andrews and department of health trigo city philippines and uh, yal penimental philippines dr kamal kishore mjp rogil gandhi university bareilly uttar pradesh and dr dinesh uh, college of pharmacy sonia pet haryana and uh, sri lakshmi narayana institute dr abarna also join with us danmir gaur from the industry torrent pharmaceutical limited himachal pradesh others from madhya pradesh and uttar pradesh andhra pradesh telangana kerala and maharashtra even more and uh, more issues from tamil nadu joined with uh, more cooperation of this particular seminar i would also like to thank our chairman v sanmugam equally to our secretary of nanda educational institute s nandakumar pradeep and through s trimurthy for this wonderful and moral support for engrave as success to my gratitude to our administrative officer krishna murthy sir nanda college of pharmacy erod and similarly i thank my team and uh, dr jagdish varan uh, who coordinated this uh, today seminar dr vadivelan and uh, interacted with uh, many people and also equally kritika associate professor and uh, dr hamlata and uh, kalpana gladys for wonderful work for the website promotional and other associate this webinar and uh, interesting and young energetic our administrative officer medical college ayurveda siddha apollo james and fargis cooperation hard work and their cooperation on and off this screen and also i thankful vice principal department of pharmacology dr sengot velu and aja sharif and lalita and equally other staff member for this organizing wonderful webinar thank you one and all thank you thank you sir uh thank you for your uh, kind uh, kind and warm welcome and uh, lovable gratitude to each and every everyone over here and uh, your motivational words towards the participants also thank you so much sir 
thank you madam yes uh, now uh, we can go for a presentation so before that uh, there is an as usual important announcement for our delegates uh, kindly follow the session uh, you are invited uh, to discuss your valuable suggestion and your doubts should we enter into our question answer box or uh, in a chat box on your control panel it will discuss with our resource person during the questionary session okay so now uh, we can invite mr apollo james professor department of pharmacy practice nanda college of pharmacy to introduce our resource person dr vadivel and please sir good morning everyone on behalf of uh, nanda college of pharmacy i am very happy to introduce our today's resource person dr r vadivel <coughs> professor department of pharmacy education and research rocklands Udagamandalam Dalitris. Dr. R. Vadivelan completed his graduation in pharmacy and post-graduation in specialization of pharmacology from the Dr. Tamil Nadu MGR Medical University, Chennai, in the year 2000 and 2002. He has been awarded PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from JSS University, Mysore in uh, 2013 and also recognized as FIC from ICS, Kolkata. Completed FELASA accredited CCLAS course at Tanovas Chennai. He has got 18 years professional experience and area of research is a metabolic disorders and alternatives to animal testing. Received APP Best Teacher Award during 2019 at APP 8th Annual Conventional and 4th Indo US Conference at JSS College of Pharmacy UT for his outstanding academic contributions. He received various grants from ICMR, DST, ACRP, and JSSAHER for conducting seminars and workshop on topics alternatives to animal testing in drug discovery, PURARS and CAL techniques. 2013, 2015, and 2017 as a convener and organizing secretary and NAM and SNT Center Research Training Fellowship for Developing Country Scientist Award of Fellowship for 2015 to 16. Received fund for improvement of SNT infrastructure in universities and higher educational institutions. FIST, DST, New Delhi, 2014 to 2019. He has made 26 presentations, published 66 national and international research publications, and authored one book. As a source person, delivered more than 24 lectures in various institutions in the areas of preclinical pharmacology. Yeah. He had guided 27 PG students and two PhD scholars. Present president of Indian Pharmaceutical Association, Nilgris Local Branch and Life Membership of IPHA, IHPA, IPA, LASA and APP and other significant contributions or principal investigator carried out various preclinical studies. With this brief introduction, I am handing over the session to Dr. Or Vadivelan. Now the screen is yours. Please, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning to all. Is it audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, before starting my session, uh, first I would like to thank uh, uh, my beloved uh, Venbusher and Principal uh, Nanda College of Pharmacy, Sivakumar, sir, uh, for your blessings and updating about my knowledge. But still, I am a student of UK and I'm still, I am trying to gather my knowledge and I'm still I'm learning. <laughs> Definitely, uh, I'll make the session uh, fruitful with your blessings, no doubt in it. And next, I'd like to thank our uh, chairman and the young secretaries of uh, Nanda Institutions uh, for giving me the opportunity. And also, I've been past few years with association with Nanda College of Pharmacy for international and national conferences. And next, I'd like to thank the team, webinar team, uh, who have interacted with me from yesterday and last week and Mr. Jagadish also, and giving a small introduction about me, Apollo James and uh, Dr. Kritika. And I would like to thank my friend, uh, the HOD of Pharmacology, Sir, also, who will be listening to this session. Uh, 
Uh, so let me make it short and uh, let me go to the topic. Uh, let me say, as Sar mentioned, why I have selected this topic, COVID-19 and diabetes. See, if you see nowadays, uh, every morning, just half an hour back, one hour back, we are getting uh, plenty of updates regarding the drugs, disease, and vaccines uh, for the management of COVID. So still now there is no uh, treatment or any pharmacotherapy for COVID-19. So we are just going with the management. Uh, let me discuss uh, with a small topic. Uh, what is the background? Uh, what is the pathophysiology? And then what are the various management of vaccines and drugs available today, up to date now? in India and globally. And in case with a diabetes patient, how we are going to manage in the situation of COVID-19. So this is a, a small topic, what I'm going to discuss. But uh, plenty of information is being collected and day by day we have to collect also. So whatever the information which I have collected, I can put a disclaimer. So everything is being collected from WHO, uh, CDC, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So all these updates are directly collected from these sources and also from the International Diabetes uh, Federation. So uh, nothing is of my own. Everything is thing what I'm going to express uh, from those sources to the daily. So to go with my topic, I think the host disabled. Apologies. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you share the screen? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Screen share. Screen share. Yes, sir. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, fine. Uh, so to stop with my topic, as I showed in my slide, the title slide, uh, COVID-19 uh, with the, the RNA virus and diabetes. So that is the hyperglycemia increase with the blood glucose level. So let me make my slides to share in a very crisp manner what exactly I'm going to discuss. So first let me discuss about the background of the coronavirus how this been the history, how this been happened. And next coming to the origin and transmission of SARS-CO2, how it has been named and how it has been transmitted. And what is the major pathogenesis of SARS-CO2? And epidemiology status, which I have been collected just one hour back from the website. And some of the signs, symptoms, risk factors and complications. So this, Slide where it is going on operating every day with various risk factors. And what are the basic diagnostic tests available in India and globally for testing the COVID-19? And how we are going to manage this COVID-19 with the drugs which are available? And then coming to one of the comorbidity, what is diabetes mellitus? And how we are going to manage the diabetes mellitus with COVID-19? And what are the key perspectives to be considered for the management of diabetes mellitus with COVID-19? So to start with the background of coronavirus 2. So how this disease has been named and from where it has been occurred. So you all will be able to see a beautiful image. So this is the place of China, Hubei, Wuhan. So if you see this, in December 2019, in few patients, three to five patients who are suffering from pneumonia, they have identified a newly beta coronavirus in that particular place. The previously one coronavirus, which is named SARS-CoV-1, so that way it is named as a new identity coronavirus. And if you see initially the proposed name by WHO, in 12th January 2020, they have named it as novel coronavirus 2019 NCOV. However, in 11th February 2020, 
WHO proposed with the name coronavirus 2019 as COVID-19 by WHO and also the CST International Committee that is Corona Study Group Committee of Global, they named it as SARS-CoV-2, what we are following with the, both the names, that is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And if you see in the March, then they identified that patient zero of age 55, and they were searching for this patient zero. So in 17th November 2020, the China's first confirmed case, that is a person you call the first carrier of this disease. So that's why it's named as still patient zero. So this is the background of how this has been emerged. That it's been named as COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And this COVID-19 is still an infectious disease uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2 and it is still ongoing pandemic. You can see more than up to date uh, today's morning that more than 200 countries are still suffering from this disease, infectious disease, and still it is going on. So what is this SARS-CoV-2? As you mentioned, it is a, a beta to beta coronavirus, which is enveloped with non-segmented positive sense RNA virus, which belongs to the subgenus of Sarbicovirus and subfamily of Arthrocorona variant. And if you see this, there are some four genera, which is including alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Previously, if you say, some six coronaviruses have been identified as human susceptible virus, which is named as alpha, COV, HCOV. And it is named like this up to HCOV, OC43. So if you see this previous six coronavirus, they have low pathogenicity causing mild respiratory symptoms. If you see among these alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, this beta coronavirus is mainly affecting the mammals and humans. And if you see this beta and delta, they are affecting the pigs and the mainly the birds. And the other two coronavirus that is called beta coronavirus, that is we always remember the SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus. So these two viruses, if you see, comparing to the previous, they are severe and potential pattern respiratory tract infections, which we call severe respiratory tract infections. And just if you're going to the structure of this coronavirus, so it is being named as corona due to the spike cell protein, which is crown. And there are some four proteins to be remembered. One is the nucleopid protein, where it bounds to the single strand RNA genome to make the nucleotide. And the other one is the spike protein. So this is very important protein where we are going to discuss in the management, where it is critical for binding of host cell receptors to facilitate the entry of host. So through this only the virus enters inside. And next is the envelope protein, where it interacts with the membrane protein to form the viral envelope. And finally, the membrane protein which is the central organizer of the COV assembly, which determines the shape, which determines the shape. And so this is a small structure to be remembered. However, we'll be discussing in the next slide about the genome of this coronavirus 2. As I mentioned, if you see the transmission, the phase 1 and phase 2, it is highly pathogenic COV, as I said, the primary host reservoir may be suspecting as that either for COVID-1 or COVID-2 or best COVID. But it is suspected for this, but for 2019, it is still a question mark. And you can see the intermediate host of the animal. It is a cat and here it is a camel and here it is SARS-CoV-2, it's a pangolin and from human to human. And this is about the low pathogenic CVS so for all the cases, you can see it may be a bat or it may be an animal. And the second phase is from human to the human.
So what is this difference between this highly pathogenic human coronavirus that which is causing the illness in pneumonia? So to highlight some of the few points, the year of isolation, we can see 2003, 2012 MESH-CO and 2019. And the receptor in which they are going to bind and showing the expression. So 2003 and 2019, it is angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE2. But for MERS, it is DPP4. And the incubation period is mostly uh, two weeks, so two to 14 days, a mean of four to five days. But in the case of SARS, it may go up to 20 days. The mode of transmission, if you see uh, with the CO2, the respiratory droplets, airborne, contaminated fomites, which is the objects, and human to human community spread. So, oral, fecal, and still, it is going on. And the mortality rate in the MERS it is more, uh, it is about the expected only, which is occurring in a particular area of Middle East, Southeast, which is Korea, 34 percentage. And SARS V2 still, it is going on increasing. And the disease symptoms, moreover, the three most important key symptoms is fever, uh, dry cough, and shortness of breath, and it includes various other symptoms also that we are discussing separately. And SARS CO1, which occurs in China, and SARS 2, as I said, Middle East, such as South Korea, and this 2019 COVID from China spreading throughout more than. 200 countries. The reservoir, as I said, the primary host is expected to be the bat. An intermediate host, here it is Kivet, and here it's camels, and here it is Malayan Tangoli. That is what the SARS with. And how it has been compared with SARS uh, CoV1? Because the genomic sequence of this SARS CoV2 is. 96.2% identical to the bad CO, that is the genome is RDATG13, in which this shares nearly 80% identity with the SARS CO. So that's why they said it may be from bad. So that is clearly it has been shown for all the things the origin is bad. And based on this virus genome sequencing results and evolution analysis, that's why, as I told you in the first slide, that has been suspected as the host of virus origin, and it may be transmitted. But still, if you see during this December month or during this January, so this is the market shown in uh, Wuhan, that there is no evidence of sale of this bat. But still, we expect it may be through the bat, and because the SARS-CoV-2 where it is identical with 79.5 percentage. And now with some of the hypothesis, it is clear that SARS-CoV-2 could use this AC2 enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, that is the same receptor where I told you as that of the humans to infect the humans. So the importance of this AC2 enzyme is more important because we know that in the case of the diabetes, uh, with that of the hypertension, they go with ACR or the ARP inhibitors, the drug of choice of drugs for hypertension in the case of the diabetes. So coming to a rough idea about the genomic organization of SARS-CoV-2. So if you take this genome encodes two large genes, one is that ORF1B, which is in blue, and orf one A that is showing in the yellow color. These are the two large genes where it is encoded with the non-structural proteins from NSP1 to NSP16. And if you see once again, these NSPs, non-structural proteins, they are processed to form the RTC, that is the replication transcription process that is involved in the genomes, transcription and replication. For example, if you're taking NSP3, so this is uh, encoded for papain like protease, and NSP5 is encoded for 3CL, that is 316 like protease, uh, respectively. So both these proteins they function in polypeptide clavy, 
and block the host innate immune response. So one of the target of the management of COVID is by blocking this uh, NSP3 and NSP5, where it is preventing from the host innate immune response. The so same like that, you can see NSP12, they encode for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and NSP3, they encode for the helicase. So therefore, the structural genome encode the structural proteins, as I mentioned, S protein, E protein, M protein, N protein, they are the structural proteins. So other than that, there are some accessory proteins also, which shades of gray in color. And they are unique for SARS-CoV-2 in terms of number, genomic organization, sequence, and function. So this is a simple genomic structure where it shows about what are the types of proteins which are involved. And if you see mainly the spike protein is involved uh, where it goes and binds to the uh, ACE enzyme receptor. So that is the same uh, explanation is being given here. And next coming to the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 in the host cell. So this is an important slide if you see where most of the drugs come and target for this condition. So we'll be able to say this is the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 and this is the cytoplasm of a cell, of a host cell. And here you can see the cell membrane. So here if you see a cell membrane, you can see the receptor of this ACE2. So here the process is by two way. One, it enters through endocytosis and then it goes out of the variant node through exocytosis. So endocytosis to the entry of the virus and exocytosis is the exit of the virus. So let's see what are the process takes place. So it is a simple process of a protein synthesis. So as we told in the image, there are four types of proteins. Mainly the spike protein will come and bind to this receptor. So this SARS-CoV-2 enters the target cell through the endosomal pathway. Endosomal pathway by cell engulfing. So first is S protein. As I mentioned, they go and bind to the AC receptor and it forms a complex. So this AC receptor and this virus, they form a complex. So once it forms complex, what happens? It gets translocated to the endosomes where S virus is being cleaved by the endosomal acid. So there is an acid protease called catespin L. So this activates the fusion activity. So this catespin will activate this fusion activity. And then what happens? This viral genome is being released that is uh, five and three, the subunits of the viral genome has been released into the viral replicase polypeptide proteins, that is PP1A and PP1AB, which are then cleaved into smaller products. You can see that by the process of proteolysis into smaller products. And then what happens? The subgenomic strand, negative strand templates are synthesis. Subgenomic negative strand are Synthesis by replicase and from discontinuous transcription plus standard germ. And here it serves as a template for a mRNA synthesis. So this process forms a mRNA template. Here it is negative. You are able to see this. So this full strength negative strength template is made a template for genomic RNA. Then what happens after this uh, transcription? The viral nucleosides, the viral nucleosides are assembled from the genome of RNA and N protein in the cytoplasm following the assembly and budding into the lumen of this ERGAC. So here the ERGAC is the endoplasmic reticulum Golgi intermediate compartment. So that means this mRNA, that the virus, it utilizes the DNA of the host uh, cell for making the strand. And therefore, what happens once after forming the strand, it gets again replication and then it it is been it is been packed, and then when it exceeds the virus load by the process of exocytosis, it gets released. Now, 
if you see the targets of the drug that is from binding to the receptor until the process of the viral load until the process of viral load the drugs will be acting in all this process either in the process of the prevention of fusion or for example your chloroquine may be acting or by the process of inhibiting this replication or by the process of inhibiting transcription in all these ways these drugs may be acting and next uh, coming to the epidemiology of this coronavirus so up to date if you take uh, where i have collected from morning uh, some 9:30 uh, if you see worldwide uh, 13.2 million uh, confirmed cases required uh, 7.3 million and death uh, five, that is uh, 575 lakhs and if you see the worldwide there is going on increasing case and if you see our india is in the third case so it's nearly uh, moving uh, to nine millions and you can see the death is around some uh, 24000 so just one hour back it is collected and if you see the total epidemiology status uh, so month by month you can see a gradual uh, increasing in the case so that's the thing if we are saying comparing to the previous months the new cases from it is going on increasing day by day so still we don't know how it to be uh, reduced still further plenty of researches and plenty of lockdown process in undergoing on and if we see in india as i mentioned it is nearly 9 million confirmed 5 million recovered and 24000 death and if we see uh, the first stands the maharashtra and second stands the in tamil nadu still every day new cases are been seen and the total it is same as a worldwide case the total cases is been going on increasing and the new cases also is be going on increasing you will be able to see there is a gradual increase in the case but the, there you will not able to see the decrease at all so that is about the epidemiology of the case where it has been updated every one hour from the websites so coming to the common symptoms of this coronavirus initially they have started with some 3 to 5 symptoms now if we see day by day there are plenty of symptoms are also included so initially they started with cough sore throat a fever uh, and then muscle pain chills shortness of breath and if we see the fever was observed in mostly 83 to 99 percentage so that's why initially they were be checking for all the persons who are traveling from abroad are within the country with various uh, travels so they'll be checking with the fever has been considered so then loss of appetite fatigue a loss of smell also if you're not able to feel that uh, smell and uh, then they may consider you are in a symptom of uh, covid and cough and muscle aches pain and in severe cases you may see difficulty in walking confusion so not only due to the stress automatically people get confused and it turns to blue space of lips coughing of load chest pain and decreased white blood cells so that is a important thing in case of covid 19 as well as in the uh, diabetes also the people will lose their immunity and possible of kidney failure and a high fever and this is the statistics which has been taken from one country So it varies from country to country, but you can see now the diary is also been included in the symptoms. We are starting from fever. The fever uploads around some eighty-seven to nine percentage. So highlighting is the three common key symptoms: fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And coming to the complication, as we said, first it goes and affects your lungs. So that's the case which has been identified by China. That is the pneumonia uh, by normally taking a X-ray or a chest X-ray. It can be easily identified. And ERDS, that is acute respiratory distress, it may lead to multi-organ failure, septic shock, and death. And then cardiovascular uh, complications, starting from your stroke, from your uh, hypertension, heart failure. So like that, damage in the blood vessels. It goes like that. And among the blood group. Uh, in a study, they found that 
the type a blood group uh, normally they have shown 48 percentage higher with the type a blood group but the exact reason for that is uncertain it was a clinical study which has been performed and among in 20 to 30 percentage they have seen there are elevated liver enzymes uh, reflecting the injury and some of the neurological manifestations affecting your nervous system including seizure stroke encephalitis and gulen barre syndrome which includes a lot of motor functions and the most complicated development in the children is the pediatric multi system inflammatory syndrome which is moreover related with the kawasaki syndrome which is found to be fatal and then if you see these complications as i mentioned how these symptoms arises so they said initially it starts from your mouth your throat and then it enters your lungs and then it enters the blood. Uh, so initially, is nowadays you may be seeing uh, the persons with uh, asymptomatic also. While they check, they may find positive also uh, until the 15 days incubation period. So initially, if you take day one to three is called onset of symptoms. Where you see 80 percent of these patients get mild symptoms, where it starts from your uh, upper respiratory symptoms from your the throat. So now they say it lives one to three days in your throat. If you're going to gargle uh, with salt water, so then automatically or a hot water, then it may get relieved. And day four to nine, you can see once after three days, it enters through your lungs, where 14 percentage of those infected experience uh, have severe symptoms. And next, if you see after day nine, then you will be able to see uh, in the blood, uh, there you can see the five percentage of these infected, uh, they need the ICU care. So therefore we can see the first three weeks of the crucial period. So that's why the government and the districts, uh, they everywhere they've taken precaution in bringing the lockdown for that is the first two weeks or first three weeks, because crucial period where it may not uh, be pandemic or it may not be transmitted and normally we see that death it is occurring uh, between the 15 and 26 second day on the onset of symptoms and the discharge where they have been from the hospital also is from 18 to 25 days so this is the way where the incubation period and how the symptoms happens the death and it can be discharged and uh, if you see who is the risk Already we know that the elderly patients above 60 years and the person who are having with the comorbidities such as hypertension, heart problems and diabetes. And you can see the young children and then you can see the pregnant women. So all these are risk during this COVID-19. So by CDC, the control for the disease center, they have given what is the risk in four stages. So no risk. Uh, that is, uh, you can walk with the people who is tested positive and was not experiencing symptoms. No risk, you can be in the same room with that person with a difference of six feet. So that is the thing they are saying us to maintain with the six feet with the face mask. Medium risk is that the close contact uh, should not be more than 10 minutes longer than six feet where he is having some symptoms. And the high risk is close hold that provides contact with the person who is tested positive. So this is considered to be important according to uh, CDC. That is the objects, the household objects in where a person suffering from COVID-19. So we should take precautions. So that's why we are bringing a lot of uh, preventive measures by using uh, sanitizers, by using sanitizers or any disinfectants which is made up of isopropyl alcohol. So now how are you going to diagnose this COVID-19? So there are specifically two methods. One is the diagnostic method, the other one is the antibody testing. So imagine if it is an acute infection. So you can go with the molecular test, which is with the RT-PCR. So the most widely accepted method for detecting the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it is a positive means it is a confirmed case. And if it is a negative, imagine 
I repeat the test if clinical findings lack with COVID-19. Uh, by saying negative, PCR does not alone rule out infection. So still there is a possibility of reoccurrence. So this is in the acute infection. During infection, so during the period of this uh, three weeks, we have to assess the severity of the infection. One is called the biochemical monitoring with several markers. So that is the CRP, the reactive proteins. When there is increase, so more severe case predicting mortality. And when there is decrease or normal, patient is starting to recover from mild disease. So this is the way how the persons are recovering. And post-infection and epidemiological surveillance. So it is based on the immune response activation. As I told you, it is the antibody testing IgG or IgM. So it is a positive means, that means he is having a past COVID-19 infection. And if the patient with the respiratory symptoms confirm with molecular tests, they exclude coronary infection at infectious stage. The negative means it does not rule out the possible past infection. It can mean the test is done too early and no antibodies are produced yet. I repeat test later. So nowadays we are going with the plasma COVID test. That is, uh, we are taking the plasma from the infected person and giving to the uh, normal person who has been affected with the COVID-19. So therefore now, as per the FDA, which is the, being submitted uh, last two weeks, there are two types of diagnostic uh, testing. One is called the diagnostic test uh, that is one is a molecular, that is the RT-PCR test, what I said. Uh, the other is the antigen test, where they specifically detect the specific antigen. And the second one is the antibody test. So we are seeing to see whether any uh, antibodies have been developed due to the immune response due to the infection. So these are the, some of the characteristics are given uh, uh, by the three tests, molecular test, antigen test, antibody. So normally this test, as I said, it is a molecular. Test where we follow. In both these two tests of diagnostic test, we are using the nasal or throat swab. In molecular test, it may take up to one week, but this antigen test is one hour off. Tested, but if this is showing positive, uh, it is unusually accurate, but negative results may need to be confirmed with this molecular test. So it is further to be confirmed. So both the cases are diagnosed active uh, coronavirus infection. It shows. And what it can do, show you are ever had a COVID-19 were infected with coronavirus in the past, and definitely it may rule out from the active corona virus infection. So antigen tests are more likely to miss an active coronavirus infection compared to molecular test. So initially they may go with the antigen test and further confirm with the molecular test. So this antibody test where they take the blood or the serum, you call it as a serological test. Here we go with the finger sticker blood to withdraw. So it may take some one to three days. That is the way we can collect the blood from a different location and it can be stored and it can be checked. Uh, sometimes the second antibody test is also need to confirm it once again. And it shows you have been infected by coronavirus in the past. By diagnosing this active coronavirus infection at the time of test, or show that you do have COVID-19. So now these are the three basic tests followed as per the FDA to start initially with the antigen and then to confirm with the molecular Further during this uh, post infection period to see whether they develop the antibodies, they go with this. So, plenty of these uh, rapid diagnostic uh, test kits from different countries uh, within India also are available for checking with different prices. So, this is the new technology where we can go for rapid uh, point of care diagnostic test where the micro sample is collected and it can be put in the office or it can be directly collected from the home or sometimes by spitting that is directly from the saliva also it can be collected and it can be checked.
So that is about the introduction about uh, what is coronavirus, what is the genome of coronavirus, what is the life cycle of coronavirus, uh, what are the symptoms, uh, what are the risk factors, what are the complications, and how it is been transmitted. So now, as I told you, up to current now, there are plenty of drugs which have been repurposed for COVID-19. All these drugs are under human clinical trials, phase two and phase three. And there is an update uh, that it may be approved, it may be approved in an individual country, but they have to pass all these clinical trials. One vaccine has been passed as clinical trial by Russia, just what I'm going to explain in the updates in the last slide. So the most commonly used drug for the management of COVID-19 is antivirus drug. That is remdesivir and paliperavir. These are the two drugs available. Other than that, your protease inhibitors such as lopinavir, rotinavir, and TMMSSR2 inhibitors such as uh, camostat, mesilate. So all these are antiviral drugs. And anti-malarial drugs are also being used initially. So what not I'm going to say the management of COVID-19. These drugs were used initially for the symptomatic relief in the management of COVID-19. But at today present, we see some of the drugs have been withdrawn uh, due to its unwanted adverse effects. And glucocorticoids, mainly the corticosteroids, dexamethasone, uh, it is used as a life-saving drug. And biologics, uh, that is, you can say monoclonal antibodies, toclizumab, uh, sarilumab, they didn't find any mortality case and now one more bolitolumab. This one drug has been approved by a DCG by India to be used. And for symptomatic, they give ibuprofen, endomethacin, and they go and interfere with this ACE2 expression. And ROS antagonists are considered to be important because they have a major role in the expression of this ACE. And therefore, the care should be taken for a hypertensive patient or for a diabetes patient while using these AC inhibitors or this ERP inhibitors. So coming to some of the characteristics of this drug and to know what is the mechanism of therapy, that is at which stage it goes and blocks the uh, process, like the replication transcription process, and what is the status of COVID of this drug. So now we see the most common drug, Remdesivir and Falipivir. Uh, they are nucleoside analog, uh, which belongs to and as I showed you, the second step, the replication process, they directly go and interfere with the replication process. So where I would like to show you, so this is the replication process, the RMDC will go and block it. That is the RTC complex where it forms. So here they go and block with the polymerase enzyme. And that is this uh, Fabipure also go and bind with this viral RD, RDP, which is essential for that process and reduces its reproduction. So both these drugs are in the phase two clinical trial and they may enter the phase three trial. And this lopinavir and ritonavir, they're HIV protease inhibitors and they can act by inhibiting this protease enzyme, that is the protease cleavage with interfering with the virus replication. So protease, you can see here, this is the process where they can go and inhibit. So, but however, due to its adverse effects, uh, WHO has withdrawn it and it has been not uh, recommended. Another drug which is uh, quite interesting, chemostat mesylate. So this is a transmembrane protease serine 2 inhibitor interfering with the viral entry. It is also in the investigational second to process. So if you see here, as I mentioned to you in the cell membrane, we are having the ACE2 receptor as well as this transmembrane protease uh, serine receptor. So this chemostate mesylate may go on inhibit this process. That is the binding process has been inhibited. So like that ivermectin, so they are also being used uh, in vitro by inhibiting the replication process under investigation. And some of the other drugs such as nefloquine, uh, selamectin, they are having the antiviral and anti-inflammatory activity. Uh, they are having a cytopathic effect of SARS-CoV-2, they reduce the cytopathic effect and decrease the viral load. 
So then it remains inside the cell and there is a possible of lysosomal activity also since they are in the investigational process. And as I mentioned, so this is the line of attack in the different uh, process where uh, it, it was made simple as first one is the fusion and endocytosis, second one translation, proteolysis, uh, translation and replication, packaging and virulent release. The first stage where it is going to bind to this receptor, the monoclonal antibodies, the Zumar, uh, where I told you, and the covalent plasma, they may go and bind to this. So that is shown clearly. So normally this virus, normally what happens, these antibodies will go and bind to this virus and it will try to block this activity of entering into it. So that is the role of this monoclonal antibody and that of the uh, covalent plasma. So that is the first stage. And another drug, as I told you, TMP or SSR, which is going to inhibit. And in the process of this, after this endocytosis, you can see this chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, they are involved in this fusion process, endosomal fusion process, by increasing this uh, endosomal pH. And as I told you, it inhibits the proteolysis, lopinavir, retinavir, it is withdrawal. And this antiviral drug, mainly they are intervening this replication transcription complex that is RNA dependent and RNA polymerase. They prevent it from a replication. So these are the line of drugs which are acting and which is currently they're repurposing. Where I highlighted and shown the first two drugs, which is making a block entry in the uh, step one. And now once again, it has been shown clearly, this remcdv is a prodrug and it is converted into active metabolite, GS441524, and where it prevents the further uh, replication of this process, where it will make them and not easily to form the single standard RNA from the host. So it is a potentially repurposed drug among the drugs available. Uh, the same image is being shown for you to understand uh, with that of the hydroxychloroquine fusion with vesicles, polymerase inhibitor, protease inhibitor, and fusion inhibitor. So making it simple to understand. So these are the drugs uh, which are available uh, today for repurposing for COVID-19 as per the data obtained from CDC, WHO and DCGI. So coming to the comorbidity of this COVID-19, as I told, as a source cv 2 enters the cell membrane through ACE2 or TMPRS2, so there are some other receptors that have also been involved. You can see the comorbidity conditions, mainly the hypertension, diabetes mellitus, neurological disorders, kidney disease, thrombosis. So like that still going on. So today they have shown that even with the uh, patients with AIDS, with that of COVID, there is a possibility of more mortality rate. So among all these things just I have been highlighted, the first is the cardiovascular disease of 13.2%. So moreover, all these are comorbidities of diabetes and CDS, so which include obese, the lung disease also. So now coming to diabetes, I think everybody know what do you mean by diabetes. So that is, it is a metabolic disorder where you can see the increase in the blood glucose level. The condition you call it as hyperglycemia. So just I've shown you the, I've shown you the, uh, healthy diabetes, how a glucose bone binds to the receptor. And in type one, the pancreas failure to produce uh, insulin. And in a type two, you can see uh, that the cells fail to respond to insulin properly. So these are the two major types of diabetes mellitus. And there are other diabetes, which is gestational diabetes occurs during pregnancy. And you know, some of the signs and symptoms that is, you can see uh, polyphagia, weight loss, underweight, fat. So you know the polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, the three P's to be remembered. And if it is increased with hyperglycemia, you can go with the blood vision. And the complications of the high blood glucose level, uh, we know that uh, diabetic, uh, that is mainly the diabetes, retinopathy, diabetic, neuropathy, diabetic, nephropathy, 
and I have to take encephalitis. So these are the four most uh, complications to be known. And this diabetes also, if you see throughout the global, there is increased uh, rise in the uh, diabetes mellitus, mainly the type two. Uh, now if you see, uh, the, you may be able to see the double or triple uh, during the age of, uh, that is uh, after 15 years or uh, 20 years. So therefore, this diabetes mellitus is considered to be one of the important uh, comorbid conditions in the case with the COVID-19. And, and uh, these are the various drugs which are available for diabetes mellitus current use. So I'm not going to explain in detail. So just to know briefly, we know that insulin, insulin is one of the important drugs which is uh, injection form it is being given uh, due to their major effects on lipid metabolism, growth or protein metabolism. Uh, it acts through the GLUT4 uh, receptor and mainly it is given in the type 1 and also in the type 2. And you are coming to sulfonyl units, say glutamate and glipizate. So they directly act on the beta cells and stimulate the insulin secretion directly acting on the pancreas. And bigonides, we are having the metformin. So they act by decreasing the glucose production and increase the glucose uptake. And the other two drugs comes into which category of GLP 1A receptor agonist and DPP 4 inhibitor. So if you see the GLP 1 receptor antagonist, they have a direct action on the a brain and appetite center by suppressing the appetite on uh, directly on the stomach where it's slowing the gastric emptying rate and directly acting on the pancreas cells by increasing the insulin secretion or by decreasing the glucagon secretion that is about the GLP-1A and nowadays we are using the gliptins that is the DPP-4 inhibitors so this, they act by inhibiting this DPP-4 enzyme where this DPP4 enzyme is involved in, in, in increasing this GLP1, RA, and other ingredients. So, therefore, by inhibiting this, it may be having a direct action. And we know about the thiazolidins, uh, rosiglitazone, and pyoglitazone, so their role in uh, glucose uptake as well as decreasing the glucose production in the liver. And sodium uh, glucose, uh, this uh, transport inhibitors of the blood glucose that directly act on the kidney and increases the glucose uh, excretion in the urine by preventing the reabsorption. So therefore, these are the currently available drugs which are being used for uh, diabetes mellitus. And here you can see in the condition of hyperglycemia, uh, that are some of the putative mechanism, we say some of the suggested mechanism there is a possibility of increased accessibility in COVID and with the diabetes mellitus. I've already told you, whenever you're going for this uh, testing, CPR testing, you may find a decrease in the WBC count. So that may be one of the important uh, thing, a parameter for the immunity. So that is the thing where the persons like immunity are easily susceptible to this disease. So you can see that there is an entry of CROs in your respiratory tract. Two things. Uh, one is infection in the respiratory epithelium. There it causes the necrosis of respiratory epithelium. So this is the way how it leads to pneumonia and ADR system inflammation and multi-organ dysfunction and directly to the cytokine storm. In other case, it may go for the acute renal injury. And the same starts to they have that acted impaired uh, macrophage activity. And the most important thing is they increase the ACE2 expression. So that is the one of the thing we should be precautious while taking this ACE or ARB inhibitors. So therefore, all these cases, they lead to the cytokine storm, either by impaired macrophage activity or impaired neutrophil count or impaired uh, this immunity cells, CD4, C4 cells, and impaired antigen presentation. So, whole you can see there is a dysregulated immune response where it will be easily susceptible for a patient with the diabetes mellitus with a higher blood glucose level, hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia in the case with COVID 19. So, that is the simple uh, highlighting point is a well controlled blood glucose level 
the survival is 98.9 percentage in the case of covid 19 and when it is a poor control so there is a possibility of the death rate there's a possibility of the death rate and the same thing i have shown here also uh, uncontrolled hyperglycemia affects the immune response heart attacks are shown organism will become more susceptible and simultaneously the important thing is here when treated with ace inhibitors or erbs this upregulates this ace2 so this ace2 enzyme upregulates you know there is a possibility of protective effects such as the anti inflammatory effects are available however this may potentiate the sars cov2 cell entry so now the question is whether the potentiation effect or the protective effect of the entry of sars cov2 and once again it leads to pancreatic beta cell damage and uncontrolled the process takes place once again and the possible drugs is been given for diabetes patients along with the oral antibody drugs is uh, they have given chloroquine or tmp or ss2 inhibitor but still they have some of the adverse effects so now what are the possible drugs uh, given in diabetes mellitus with covid 19 and what should be monitored and then what is in practice so insulin is the choice for type 1 diabetes and, uh, i think there is no other choice one of the important adverse effect of this insulin is hypoglycemia so therefore this hypoglycemia request to be monitored there is a possible of high risk and it is no other choice, the drug of choice in critical ill patients. Metformin, bigonates, there is a risk of lactate acidosis in hypoxia and acute illness. So therefore, stop if severely ill with hemodynamic instability or hypoxia. Having the sulfonyl areas, so we know that mainly there is a risk of hypoglycemia if oral intake is poor uh, with the concomitant use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. So care should be taken and we should stop if unable to maintain the regular food intake or at risk of hyperglycemia and with the, the pyoglitazones you can see the risk of fluid retention and edema that may be contraindicated in hemodynamic instability so with a severe case it may lead to hepatic or cardiac dysfunction so it should be monitored and you can see the other comorbidity drugs we are using the SGL2 uh, risk of dehydration and ketoacidosis so this ketoacidosis should be monitored and it should be stopped the GNP ARPS as they act a direct effect with update center the GAT side effects should be taken into consideration and if it happens we have to stop it and DPP4 inhibitors they may be prescribed and may be conti continued with the non-critical ill patients because there is a lower risk of hypoglycemia and possibly a wide range of use for renal function. And as I told you, these are some of the other uh, related uh, comorbidities along with the diabetes with hypertension. The drug of choice with AC1 or AC, that is ERP. So here there is a possible uncertain risk of increased susceptibility for infection, where I showed in the previous slide. And uh, sometimes we may give aspirin as an antiplatelet agent. Uh, risk of cardiovascular disease should, and GAT also should be taken. And statins, normally they are given with uh, diet phase with hyperlimidia conditions. So the possible risk of myositis and transaminitis should be considered. But the risk benefit ratio for the individual patient should be considered. So based on all these uh, drugs which are available for diabetes mellitus, and for the management of COVID-19, the WHO suggests some of these drugs previously. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine may be given, but the caution with hyperglycemia, as I mentioned, with insulin and insulin secretogogs. And uh, lopinavir, ritonavir may be given, but we have to see the hyperglycemia and also the interaction with statin because the risk of hepatic and muscle toxicity. Glucocorticoids, life saving drug, we know that uh, that is also for COVID 19, but this drug is having one of the adverse effects of hyperglycemia. Therefore, the blood glucose level should be monitored. Our MCDV, Famipivir, 
Uh, so these are the potential repurposing drugs which are under the clinical phase uh, three. So the aflatoxin is adverse effect. So the risk benefit ratio to be considered. So these are some of the drugs which have been managed uh, for the treatment of, uh, you can say, uh, COVID-19, not treatment, we can say management of COVID-19 along with diabetes. And what are the key perspectives to be considered in COVID-19 with a patient with diabetes? There are four important key perspectives. One is the first one is the hygiene and social distancing, where it is widely recommended. And second one is the glycemic control, regular medications, monitoring, monitoring all the levels, healthy lifestyles with uh, exercise and vegetables, stress management, and the comorbidity control and routine vaccination. So that is being highlighted with the proper hygiene, with the social uh, distance, regularly monitoring the blood glucose level, keeping your health diet with the vegetables, fresh leaves, and doing uh, monitoring the diabetic ketoacidosis condition, and at least doing the regular exercise uh, where it may be reduce the risk, and you may also have some medication, good sleep, and avoid uh, the smoking, alcohol, and we have to check for the comorbidity conditions, diabetes for common conditions, and we have to go for the routine vaccination. So these are the key perspectives uh, to be considered and to be uh, managed with uh, COVID-19 with the patients with the uh, diabetes. And if you see yesterday, uh, Dr. B. Suresh, uh, President of Pharmacy Council of India, and post chancellor of JSA had in one of his slides where he's giving the webinar about the pharmacy profession in Kashmir University. He has shown there are so many drugs in quarantine 19 with the dancing. Many drugs comes with many countries, with many companies, and uh, such as uh, Remdesivir with their approval status in the phase two trials. And WHO also, as I said, they discontinues this hydrochloroquine and lopinavir, ritonavir arms for COVID-19 and approval of ivermectin in the phase two trial. And you know that this Demsinivir is also approved by Japan for treatment with the patients, but outside Japan, it is understood the uh, IND drug. And you can see the dexamethasone as I told, particle steroids, uh, the first drug shown to save lives. So like that, there are plenty of drugs which are available coming every day with their uh, approval status. And if you're seeing the vaccine tracker, there are uh, more than, if you can say what I read is, more than 122 vaccines are available throughout the globe, where which has come out from the preclinical testing, it is shown here, they all are with either a phase two or phase three clinical trials. In India, you can see Jadis Cadilla and Covidax with Bharat Biotech. These two companies are coming out. And therefore, yesterday's news, you can see Russia's uh, Shivan University completes the human trials for COVID-19. But uh, completing with one country, it cannot make out uh, for the management of COVID-19. India is also playing an important country where you're having the economy and the human resource uh, to be carried out in a different uh, types of people. And I think uh, yesterday's news a biocon got approval from DCGI and a hike of 10 percentage. They use this monoclonal antibody that is itolizumab for the COVID treatment, which uh, updated the 15 hours ago. So, therefore, uh, giving a brief introduction about COVID 19 management of the drugs and uh, how to manage in the case of the diabetes. But I still say, still, the research. Uh, innovations on vaccine drugs are under progress and still further information to be collected day by day. And I would like to say stay home, stay lives because nowadays the lockdown started happening everywhere. And that is the way only we can help to stop virus. Stay home, keep a safe distance, wash hands often, cover your cough. If you're sick, please call the helpline which has been provided. So previously we saw some of the health professionals, uh, professionals are called the barriers, 
nowadays each and every person in the uh, community society all are considered various so i would like to thank all and one and all and all the covid 19 warriors so thank you and if you are having any questions if i am able to answer and let me answer uh, sir thank you uh, thank you so much sir okay right uh, so actually uh, your session is highly informative sir you had proved that uh, uh, being a pharmacologist you had uh, clearly um, explained about uh, what is mean by uh, the corona virus and how what is the source behind the transmission and what are all the drugs which are all uh, acting on what kind of receptors as well as uh, nicely you had um, uh, joined the diabetes mellitus along with that and uh, you highly um, impressed us definitely it's informative sir thank you so much Uh, thank you thank you yes yeah, so, so now uh, it's the time for questionary session yeah. uh, the suggestions and the questions from our participants are entered into our question answer bo box sir yeah. uh, now we can invite uh, mrs gladys kalpana professor department of pharmacology nanda college of pharmacy to join with us for this discussion please ma'am yeah. hi sir good afternoon sir yeah. how are you okay. is it audible ma'am Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I'll uh, throw one by one questions from our participants, and the first question is from one of our participants: Is uh, can COVID nineteen trigger the onset of diabetes? That is, new diabetic patients are uh, emerging. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a question to be asked for a diabetic specialist or a physician. Okay. So now comparing, as I mentioned in my case. so diabetes is a one of a metabolic disorder where you will be able to see there is a uncontrolled glucose level if the person is not able to maintain this glucose level proper diet or exercise or stress uh, then definitely it is going to worsen the condition along with this covid 19 and uh, we cannot predict that uh, the mortality is less in india because Uh, if you see in india the government has taken some initiative steps by bringing the lockdown for the past 3 months and it has reduced the mortality rate there in the case of uh, us uh, i think you know about the trend yes given a miss decision by using directly the disinfectant as a injection i think it is already commented everywhere so that's why their rate is high but comparingly in future uh, weeks or months we have to wait and see this going to be more uh, how we are going to control it yeah, i think you have answered uh, the another question from our participants also yeah uh, so uh, the next question from our participants is uh, uh, they is asking why diabetic patients are more prone to be affected by covid 19 infection but i have shown in one of my slide it is due to the dysregulated or decreased immunity you know the macrophages the t cell cells so due to this hyperglycemic condition what happens their immunity will response will be decreased so when the immunity response is decreased automatically what happens it makes easy for the virus to replicate and do the process okay so that is one of the So when you, if you try to want to put a simple power, when your immune power is less, you are easily susceptible for this coronavirus. Yeah, and the next question from one of our participants is: uh, Does the COVID-19 viral protease cleave the viral polyprotein fusions in order to make them function? Yeah, that's what I said. In the case of proteases, what happens in the third step? this uh, covid 2 it will you utilizes the enzymes and it will try to make a single strand that is by forming the polypeptide and it is based upon the host uh, function of the cell so now simple thing we want to say this uh, single strand rna that is the coronavirus utilizes the genome of the host cell to make it active and by increasing the virus load it comes out So therefore, definitely it utilizes 
the host cell to make the mRNA functional. Not the host uh, functional. Not the one when the host cells get infected. Okay, thank you, sir. And the next question is, uh, doctor, which ACE inhibitor drug is treating uh, is used for the treatment of COVID nineteen? And another question from the same participants is, uh, why ibuprofen is uh, denied in the usage towards COVID nineteen? And uh, they are asking about your suggestion, sir. Okay, okay. So, uh, as I told you, as a pharmacist, uh, as per my knowledge, I may give my suggestion. Uh, normally. Uh, no drugs are used for treating COVID-19. You keep in your mind. This ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, normally they are used in a diabetes patient or in an anti-hypertensive patient. So normally, while you are using this drug, what happens? It will go and block this ACE enzyme. So this will what happen? It will upregulate ACE. That means it will increase that is expression of ACE. Therefore, what happens? It becomes easy for the virus to entry inside. So my thing is that whenever you are using the ACE inhibitor or a AAR inhibitor, the proper monitoring a care should be given. So definitely using ACE inhibitor, AC inhibitor is used not for treating COVID. It is being used for hypertensive or in the case of hypertension with their diabetes. In that cases, what happen? It upregulates the ACE. Therefore, the coronavirus easily it attacks inside the host cell, and still it makes the condition worse. Makes the condition worse, and ibuprofen was given as a uh, what you can say you as a symptomatic relief in the case of the pain. And uh, this also upregulates the ACE2 enzyme expression. That's why this ibuprofen non-slandimony drugs, uh, as per WHO, it is the not recommended. Okay, sir. And the next question from one of our participants is: Is there any change in treatment modalities for COVID patients having diabetes? That's what I have given uh, two slides clearly. It is uh, based upon case by case. We have to see a type one patient is taking an insulin. We should know what type of insulin is going to take. So when he's taking insulin, the hypoglycemia considered is to be monitored. Then, if you're going for another different types of drugs, I will show what are the parameters to be monitored. And if it exists, you should stop it and you should go for another alternative drug. Because there is no only one category of drug. There are four to five category of a drug. So it is based upon the individual case what a diabetic patient is taking, and he may shift to another drug uh, by an uh, we can say advice by a, a diabetologist or a physician. So that may be advisable. I think you have answered the questions of our participants. Thank you so much for your patience and valuable suggestions, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, ma'am and sir, for your valuable clarification. Uh, so now uh, this is time for uh, out of thanks. So we can invite uh, Dr. Jagadishwaran, Professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Analysis, to deliver the out of thanks. Please, sir. Yeah, warm good afternoon to all. It's my privilege uh, to propose a vote of thanks. My sincere thanks to the management. Sri Nanda Educational Trust for providing the facilities and engagement for this national webinar. I may like to express my gratitude to our resource person, Dr. R. Vadivelan, Department of Pharmacology, JSS College of Pharmacy, UT, for spending this valuable time with us in his busy schedule. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. T. Shivakumar, for his enthusiastic support and proper guidance. Thank you, sir. I also thank to our chief administrative officer, Dr. K. Krishnamurthy, for his moral support and coordination. Thank you, sir. Our heartfelt thanks to the participants from various departments in and around the country. Last but not least, I thank to the organizing committee members for their technical support and guidance. Thank you, Onadal. Uh, thank you, Onadal. 
madam i think uh, we can close the session yeah so yeah uh, this is a conclusion speech sir Uh, so thank you so much and thank you uh, jagdish pran sir for giving a kind mm -hmm. gratitude to each and every one and uh, the delegates are also uh, very eager to fill their feedback form to get their e certificate so the announcement is there uh, we already sent the feedback link to your mail in yesterday mail itself uh, in that uh, zoom link no along with that uh, feedback link is also there kindly check it over it can be active after the session within a seconds i will be activate it and i express my appreciation to all of our uh, delegates for their patient listening and cooperation towards the session and uh, i would like to inform you that sir uh, uh, dr adivelan sir uh, yes. so uh, actually uh, the today session we reached the maximum number of uh, delegates sir we uh, feel very okay. proud to announce that okay, okay. sir thank you thank you and 1500 registrations more than that we reached okay, okay. sir uh, thank you thank you so much sir Thank and um, uh, and uh, for the delegates this session is uh, exist in our youtube nanda tv channel you can go and uh, like it and subscribe to watch forever for the further reference for your career and uh, thank you one and all bye take care we will meet you in another session shortly thank you thanks a lot bye.